Hi, I'm Corey Nathan, and this is Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. You're home for edifying, provocative, and fun conversations among high profile public figures and regular folks like me. We talk about faith and politics and all kinds of topics that really matter in our culture. So if you're tired of all the screamers out there taking all the oxygen out of the room and you want to join us and taking some of that space back, you'll love talking politics and religion without killing each other. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy today's show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan. You know, I am so grateful to be able to have conversations with informed, principled, interesting people about important topics like faith and religion and so much more. And I'm grateful to be able to share with our growing community of engaged listeners. I'm really excited to announce that it's easier than ever to find us and join this community, perhaps support us. And that's on politicsandreligion.us. The A-N-D is spelled out, politicsandreligion.us. It's finally working. Uh, I'm not a tech genius, obviously, but we do have that thing working. So check it out. Consider becoming one of our patrons, and that'll really help us continue to have conversations like the one we're having today with William Salatin. Salatan. Wait, Salatan. Like Callahan. Salatan. Yeah. Or right. Tal- Taliban. That's the other way you can. <laughs> oh, okay. Of course, if you're actually going to pronounce it, it's Taliban. So that messes it all up. Oh, but it is, it's, okay. it's Salatan. Yeah. Salatan. William Salatan wrote for Slate for 25 years. And I might be wrong about this, but wrote over 2,700 pieces for the Daily Online magazine. He's also the author of Bearing Right, How Conservatives Won the Abortion War. And Will is now a writer at The Bulwark, who, as he says, questions everything. Will Salatan. So thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Uh, great, great. That was just that, that was such a great lead in, you know, about was listening to what you said about the informed and principled people. So I'll be a change of pace, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll be the uninformed, unprincipled person. Well, we have had one uninformed, unprincipled person, but I won't say who that is. That's for our subscribers. <laughs> I'll share that inside information behind the scenes for our subscribers. Okay, so in all seriousness, um, when Josh Good of Faith Angle Forum mentioned your name, and, and I, I, I'd already been reading a lot of your stuff over the years, uh, but then went out to Faith Angle Forum and listened to, read some of your contributions there, I, I, I was compelled to reach out. So I'm really grateful when you accepted our invitation, uh, albeit you know, you're putting yourself in harm's way here, maybe. <laughs> but since I, I've been so encouraged by all that Faith Angle Forum is doing, and you've been involved with the organization going back many years, I'd love to take a second for you to describe what your involvement with the organization as a journalist uh, has been and, and why you've made a point of contributing to their efforts. Well, uh, I, I can't even remember. I, it, I've gone there for like more than 20 years, I think. The, I mean, not regularly, but uh, I think the first time I went to Faith Angle was right around 2000, wasn't it? I mean, they used to be in Key West. Um, you know, Michael Cromerty was running it. And um, I went every so often. Um, and I, I've, I love it. I love it. And as I've told them, it's one of the rare, it's it's like a little break from the, from the routine of, um, I mean, it's like college to me in a way, like you're, you're talking about meaningful things and they're, they're interested in, you know, what's it all about? Uh, and they're not interested in the horse race. They're interested in sort of, you know what they're interested in, Corey, they're interested in right and wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's very, for a political journalist, that's very refreshing. So I, I love Faith Angle because you, you, you get to go and talk about what you, what you think, what, what should be done, what's really important in this world. And also uh, for me, you know, it's, it's so interesting because I, I'm from a liberal environment uh, and it's a, an environment where religion is looked at as often something foreign or dangerous. And I love religious people. I love to like hang out with people who are always asking the question, you know, what they should be doing. It's not, not who's up and who's down, not advantage and disadvantage, but what's it all about and, and what's right and what's wrong. You know, it's interesting you bring it up that way, because as I listen to your podcasts, uh, you know, the the ones that you're doing now with Charlie Sykes, 
as I've listened to you in the past, it, you know, stuff that you've done in the past, your writing, it, there's a few things that strike me. One is that you have this balance of keeping the big picture in mind, like what, what the important stories are, what, what's important for us to be digging into, as well as the continued curiosity and hunger to dive deeper into the details of a given story. But also, it strikes me that how, how do you stay, how do you keep those two competing uh, perspectives in mind without getting lost in the weeds, as well as just the more functional of how do you stay as well informed as you clearly are? Well, the, the, I've changed over the years. Um, I, I mean, I used to sort of write blog year stuff. Like what's your, you know, I think it's some of it's just age. When I was younger, I mean, I didn't come in through fact-based journalism. I came through opinion journalism, which isn't to say it's not fact-based, but, but it's not focused on the fact, right? Like what people would say, what, what's your take on whatever it is? You know, and it was the era of blogs. Something would happen and you're like, what do you think about it? And so you'd express your opinion and you would maybe grab a couple of facts to back up your opinion, but it was mostly like, was your take different or interesting from more interesting than somebody else's take? Was it contrarian? Was it surprising? Did it shed some light? And all that's great. But when you're young, you're sort of hearing yourself talk, you're seeing yourself write, you're like, you know, here's my imprint on the world. <laughs> and then like, as, as I got older and I just looked, reflected on what I was writing, I got kind of sick of myself. I mean, like, <laughs> what, what is your, why is your take better than anybody else's take? Okay, it's yours, but it's not like, are you really, what are you contributing to the world, you know? And so what's happened to me over time is I've gotten sick of my own opinion, but I've gotten really interested in facts. And I mean, for people who came through fact journalism, people who were reporting for the Washington Post or the New York Times or their local paper or NPR, whatever it is, like that was their job was to report the facts of, and, and it may be that it was sort of the facts that were presented to them. You go to a briefing, you're told some things, you report what you were told. That's not the facts, but it's the, the information that you were given, right? There's a lot of that in journalism. But for, for those of us who came from opinion journalism, like what I, what I came to love about facts is, and depend on is facts are the best way to resolve differences. You can have your take and I can have mine, and, you know, we can go out and scream it to everybody, but what have we actually accomplished, right? The, what we can accomplish is, if I disagree with you, can I bring a fact that can change your opinion and vice versa? In the conversation, maybe I'll learn a fact from you that changes my opinion. And it's not just that one of us like pushed the other, but like we made some progress because we learned something. It, that you bring up uh, quite a pickle that we're in here nowadays. Uh, I think it was your first column in the Bulwark. Um, yeah, I, the first column for the Bulwark. You said, it turns out that you don't have to renounce any of our nation's founding principles to betray them. All you have to do is believe lies. <laughs> so, so you're talking about facts when we can't agree on what facts are. You know, we're, we're, literally. So I'll give you an example. One of what I thought was a historical day in our nation's history was January 6, 2021. And when I was watching what was, I'm on the West Coast, when I was watching what was unfolding, it was more, still morning here. I thought, is this going to be another one of those moments when it sort of breaks the fever and we all, like, we can't now ignore facts. But I, I had to um, I had to go somewhere. I was in, in the car and I was listening to and I, I've I've shared some of this uh, on this podcast before. So I was listening. I was I specifically listened to um, the Will Cow majority, I think it's called. And then right after that, Sean Hannity comes on an XM radio. And um, I heard the beginnings of what became these congealed talking points that they're still peddling today. You know, some of which were, you know, many people are saying it's really Black Lives Matter and Antifa, or um, I think it was Will Cow who said, well, what did you expect would happen when the election was stolen? And, and these other talking points that, were, that are still um, happening. So all that to say, what can we do when we're not living? I mean, we're living in the same reality, but there's this, I don't know, there's this talent to, to you know, have alternative facts, if you will. How do we, how do we deal with that? So 
Uh, there's a piece that I wrote shortly after January 6, 2021, shortly after that crisis in Slate. And it's funny because in that piece, I said, you know, people on the left should support fact-based journalism on the center right. And one of the places I named was The Bulwark. At the time I wrote this, I had no idea that I was going to end up working at The Bulwark, but I had a lot of respect for The Bulwark. And part of part of what I was trying to address was your question. Um, you have the people living in another reality. Now, the, the unfortunately, part of the answer to your question is some people will, some people who believe lies and believe it with the best of intentions. They have, you know, they have gotten lost in the Fox News cinematic universe, or they're watching One American News or Newsmax or something. And they they're just inside this world. And I know people who know people who are in this situation. And I'm not a Christian. If I were, maybe I would have more confidence in rescuing them. I believe they will never, some of these people will never come out. They will believe that um, until the day they die. And that is tragic. But there are a lot of people who are somewhat, who have a foot in that world. They're, they're listening to that stuff. They're watching it. Uh, who can be Who can be brought out? And they can be brought out just through conversations. First of all, they're only going to listen to people who they believe care about them, right? Somebody close to them. They're not going to like some liberal arguing with them with them is not going to change their mind. But somebody in their family who believes in facts and who and who they know loves them personally can can move them. That's that's they have to be open emotionally. They have to believe that the person cares about them. But what what can pull them is 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 information, information that they can verify, something that, you know, somebody, who, the, the, you know, it's this, this, it used to be some TV pastor who was telling you something that was false. Now it's a politician more often than not. They're telling you this thing, but, you know, actually grandpa, actually uncle, you know, what the, here is the thing that you know to be true. And here's this person telling you the opposite. So, you know, will you, come with me a little bit here and away from this person and reconsider that. Um, part of what I argued in this piece was that politics is not working, but science is working really well. Science was, you know, in the last two years, what is the biggest uh, success that we've had? And it is easily the COVID vaccines. Yeah. Easily. Um, think about the number of lives that have been millions of people who are alive today around the world because in a very short time, science worked. How does science work? Science works by testing hypotheses. You believe something to be true, you, would, you, can, you deliberately construct an experiment to, to see whether it's true. And you are, part of what you were doing when you were conduct, conducting an experiment, you're deliberately putting your belief at risk. That's deliberately, you're, you're saying, if, it's, if my belief is true, this will happen. And if that doesn't happen, I am accepting that my hypothesis, my belief was false. And that's not a failure if your hypothesis was false. That's a success because your goal is not to validate what you believe, it is to learn. And all I can tell you is that method of thinking of approaching the world is working magnificently compared to the, the, our political way of, of, of behaving, which is to try to confirm, try to validate my opinion and destroy yours. So, I think we should be learning from science. We should be following the scientific method. And the essence of the scientific method is deliberately testing your beliefs to see if they're false and being willing to accept the falsification when it happens. I would also posit that that is happening throughout other academic work. You know, as you talk about the scientific method, I completely agree with you that a lot of folks don't understand that process or maybe a fast food version of that process has been foisted on them, you know, so that we could sort of do proof test, proof, the equivalent of proof texting with science. And here's a scientific fact, and this is science. You know, when I say academic work, uh, one of my favorite theologians is actually uh, vocationally a historian, a fellow named N.T. Wright, Tom Wright. And his, his, his biggest contributions in terms of history, uh, a lot of work on first century Israel, and he entered into that larger project. I think it's five volumes in now uh, that he's written over the last 25 plus years. He and he's a he's um, a, now a bishop with the Anglican Church. He entered into that project, risking the possibility that some of his 
fundamental beliefs or foundational theological beliefs would be shaken by what he was learning historic in terms of the history. But what it did and what I think good science does is it enriches our understanding and the beauty of the universe, or it enriches the nuance of, of what was happening contextually, in this case with N.T. Wright's work, historically, to help us better understand what was being written in the initial epistles and what they were talking about as first century Jews among each other. You know, but I'm getting a little bit off track. You mentioned something, you mentioned something at the beginning, your, your move to Bulwark, which I really wanted to, I wanted to ask you about. So 25 years, most marriages don't last 25 years. <laughs> And you moved to the bulwark, not to, I'm, now I'm starting to sound like the, the Jew, the, my Jewish uh, background is coming out. The Jew, how could you leave us after all these years? That's no. great. We're, we're, well, we're both Jewish. So between <laughs> us, so between us, Corey, we've got three opinions. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, more than that, actually. Um, but, uh, but I'm even worse. I, I, I grew up very observantly Jewish. I became a Christian uh, in my late 20s. So that means I'm a Christian, but I feel really guilty about it. No, I'm not just. So, so you got two opinions by yourself. That's great. Yeah, okay. That's right. That's right. Okay. So the bulwark, for me, the emergence of independent media, this whole ecosystem, the bulwark, the dispatch. Uh, so, so one of my favorites is Ron Steslow's, the, the politicology, Matt Lewis's thing, uh, Pete, Do so many, Pete Dominic, they, they, it just, it gives me hope, not just for the future of journalism and commentary, but that we still have platforms for independent thinking. Prince, I use this word again, uh, principled and informed voices of goodwill and good faith. So I, is that is that what drew you to an outlet like the Bulwark? Why did you make that move? OK, so I had been working at Slate for such a long time that, I mean, everything changed around me, right? Like if you were in the same place, for you're not in the same place 25 years later, right? Every, everything's different. Yeah. The, you know, I came in 1996, just to give you an idea of like how different it is. I went to work at Slate in 1996. The internet, internet journalism was just starting. It was a time when people literally thought that Slate wasn't real because it wasn't on paper. You know, only only paper journalism was real, right? Like it was like a this subs this thing, right? If I can't touch it, it isn't real. Now it's silly, like you can't you can't hit, find a print button anywhere on, on the internet. Um, so uh, that completely changed. But um, when Slate started, it was so it was Michael Kinsley who was who I had way way back when I had been an intern at the New Republic. So that's how I knew Mike Kinsley and the New Republic in the nineteen eighties just to show how old I am, with late 1980s was like, it was democratic, but it was sort of the democratic center. And it had people like Fred Barnes worked there and Charles Krauthammer. So there were, it was democratic towards the middle with some people from the right. That was sort of, and, and at the time, you know, the Democratic Party was sort of working in the center shortly after that is the Bill Clinton era. Anyway, so Slate had a little bit of Kinsley's flavor in the 1990s, right? It was, again, people who were sort of center left. It had, you know, Kinsley had some people from the right who wrote in the in Slate. And, but, but everybody was kind of sort of a centrist liberal type. And like when the Iraq war happened, there were a lot of, there were liberals at Slate who went along with the Iraq war. And so over time, the media polarized and slate drifts slate drifts to the left right and this it's not specific to slate this is happening to all of opinion journalism it's you we can argue about how it happened but i think a lot of it is cultural like within the media culture uh and traffic i think the traffic rewards the wings you mm. go to the wings you there's nobody you know there's not a lot of enthusiasm in the middle. If you if you go on Twitter and you start screaming and yelling that the other side is evil, you'll quickly pick up a lot of followers on one wing who hate the other wing, right? Duly noted. If you're, if you're, <laughs> if you're in the middle, you're boring people. Like, come on, you know, like say something exciting to me. I'm a radical <laughs> centrist. How's that? Does that work? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> it hasn't, it hasn't been. So, so what happened to me was, I kind of, I believe that I kind of stayed where I was. I mean, not say like, I don't want to say it in a way like I didn't grow, but like I, I am still sort of a sort of center left or center person and Slate sort of just moved to the left. Now that was part of a larger thing where I had an interesting discussion with my editor at Slate 
the last piece that I wrote, he, he said, you know, why don't you write about like what it's, what you've learned, you know, 25 years of argument. And I didn't want to write 25 years of argument. I wanted to write 25 <laughs> years of learning. And so I talked about what I had learned. But one of the questions he raised for me, which was interesting, is he said, is it really true? Because I had sort of implied that Slate became less diverse over time, like it became more left. And he raised the question, is it really, is that really true? Was Slate at, in, in its original 1996 version less diverse in some ways? And the answer is, I mean, certainly we, we agree that it was true racially and ethnically, right? If Slate was all white, you know? And so like it became much more ethnically diverse over time. And part of my feeling was that over time it became less politically diverse in the sense that everybody was on the left. Like just you hire people who are like you, liberals hire liberals and pretty soon it's left hiring left. And you're like, you've, you're losing some of your liberal, you know, diverse pluralistic origins. But he was correct. He was correct when I went back to look that in fact the slate and this is true of a lot of opinion journalism in you know, the 1990s or back in the day, the center was the center, it didn't have the left in it, right? So there weren't a lot of left viewpoints in, in the original Slate. So now Slate has moved sort of to more left. And what happened was that but since I was in the same place, I ended up on the right of Slate. And I ended up doing all of my talking to people on my, to my left. And it's an interesting group, but it's not like the middle of the spectrum. It's not naturally what feels right. To, like I feel my, the way I understand myself, which could easily be wrong, right? Our self understandings are inadequate. Was that um, I, I believe that it's almost chance what kind of family you're born into. Like you grew up in, a, I grew up in a democratic household. I don't know about you, but yeah. like, so I grew up in a democratic liberal household. And they believed a lot of things, which I mostly I still believe. But there were all these things that I didn't grow up hearing because I wasn't in a conservative or Republican household. Well, does that mean the stuff that I wasn't hearing as a kid was wrong? Sometimes, yes, but sometimes I just wasn't hearing it, right? So if you like expose yourself to more different people, I'd go to Faith Angle and I'd hear people who are more conservative than me. And they had an interesting thing to say. And you know what? It turned out that a lot of what they had to say was right. Yeah, it's just true. Right. And so if you expose yourself. So so my point, Corey, is just that I was ended up talking to the left and I wanted to sort of shake that up. I wanted to get out and talk to people to my right because I'm already a little to the left of the middle. Right. And so there's this whole broad audience. And to, when the what happens, the folks at the bulwark approached me and I already admired them. But I thought, here's a chance to like go and speak to this audience of people in the political center. And I, that's really important to me because I feel like that's where the action is. I mean, we're still in a very polarized political environment, but if we're going to move, you know, people and like make progress and get people to be saner, which is what I feel like we need to do, I want to be speaking to people across the middle, right. right? Some people, so I'm losing some of my audience on the left, but I'm gaining some audience in the middle. And especially I'm super interested to talk to these people who come from the right of the spectrum, but who made this principal decision when Donald Trump emerged that they were not gonna fall into that cult um, from a religious point of view, that blasphemy and that idolatry, and they were going to hold first to their principles and they're trying to figure out what to think. And I think this is a super interesting dynamic space to be writing in. So that's part of why I'm there. Yeah, no, and I'm, I'm right there with you. Some of my favorite platforms I mentioned before, but the Bulwark in particular, I mean, uh, there's so much really good content from a diversity of voices, a, you know, very pluralistic, uh, to use a word that you used before, uh, between the podcasts and just great writers. Uh, I'm addicted to the to the morning shots, Charlie's morning shots. It's It's really a great platform. But to your point, you know, some of my favorite contributors, uh, not just to the Bulwark, but across media are folks who had to take those risks and it really cost them something, you know, whether it's former politicians like Joe Walsh or Charlie himself, you know, who lost his, his national audience um, or politicians or even strategists, it, it really cost them something. So that's where principle, interesting, when, when principle really costs you something, and we're seeing that right now internationally, but before we get there, I, I have a, some questions about that. But before we get there, I did want to, staying in this uh, transition from Slate to the Bulwark, you, you, your last piece for Slate, you said every day the news changed 
something happened or a new topic came up or events put a new twist on some old issue. And my mission before I talked or wrote about the new thing was to learn about it. So is that still your mission now or? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's part of the job. Like you, you have an idea, you start out with an idea, you, something's happening in the news and you think, huh. And, and this little magic thing occurs to you that we call a take. <laughs> and you're like, hi, I wonder if I could write this argument. And then, you know, you go and read and learn a little more, right? And to see, and the, the, the first corruption that happens in opinion journalism is what happens when you find a piece of information that contradicts your take, right? Your initial take. Do you write the take anyway? Do you say, ah, you know what? Let's forget <laughs> that. Let's, I just won't talk about that or I'll like, you know, I'll squish my way around it. You know, you, you can think like a lawyer, like my case is I'm going to argue this original thesis I had in mind and I've come across an inconvenient fact and my job is to like explain to the court why they should ignore this fact or why, you know, I can distinguish it as the lawyers say, right. That's lawyer thinking. Sorry. I don't want to insult the lawyers, but like if you, <laughs> you, you come in with a point, right. I like to be free to say, you know, actually I'm going to switch and argue the other side. Right. Cause like I learned something in the course of the research um, that changed my mind. And it usually isn't that I'm completely wrong, but like there's some complication. I had an idea of, of how something was, how the world was. And I've learned this thing and it's actually not the way I thought it was. It's sort of that way, but here's a different way of understanding it. And invariably, if you go with the grain of reality of, of what you learn, your argument will be more interesting because you will have to say, you know, it's not that, you know, the people on the other side are all just bought out by corporate whatever or, you know, liberal yada yada. They're like, you know, they believe what they're arguing and they have actually a good reason based in history. But like there are reasons why that th they're applying something in the wrong way or they've learned the wrong lesson or something like that. So it, it's always better if you go with reality. It's better for your soul. It's better for the reader because they're learning something instead of you deceiving them. And it's better for the complexity of, of your argument because your argument is truer and richer. Well, one of the things I've really appreciated about your work, and sometimes it's, it's, it's funny, actually, it's uh, you, you don't take yourself so seriously as to think that you have to have basically come out of the womb with all of the right answers. You, you often say, I got this absolutely wrong, and here's why. Um, one of the pieces I caught, oh, by the way, so your, your writing style, um, be, uh, I, I read, I think, I forget if it was in a column of David Brooks or one of his books, but he described how he put together his columns. And, and I wondered if this resonates with, how, with your process. He, he knows he's going to have about 10 paragraphs, plus or minus, and for every paragraph, uh, that supports the, the the big idea that he's writing about. He has so much source material for each paragraph. And I've noticed in your pieces, the reason that it took me forever to get through that last uh, column at Slate is because you had so many different references and I was going down all these different rabbit holes. Is that kind of how you approach your, your writing? Yeah. I mean, ideally what you want to get to is you want to be respectful of the reader's time and you want to like, you, you want to sort of boil it down so they don't have to do all the work you did, but you want to show them the work and ideally link to the work. So that, I mean, I think the best kind of writing is when you make it as short as the reader wants it to be, but you also make it easy for the reader to investigate further. Like you, your take, I, I really hate it. And like the New York Times is getting a little better with, for, I mean, I hate the culture of authority. I hate the idea that I am in a, I have been reporting for 30, 40 years. And therefore my judgment is, you know, is infallible and you should trust me. No, don't trust me. Do not <laughs> trust me. Like, do not, here are my links. Check it out. If I'm, you know, not, and I'm not even giving you all the links, like go, go find your own links and check, you know, see, see if you see if my links are the right links, you know, but like, I'm going to show you my work and you can, if you want to learn more, you can, if you want to spend, you know, two hours on this, go be my guest. But if you want to spend three minutes and be done with it, uh, I should write it in a way that doesn't require, you know, I really hate people writing 2000, 5,000 words when they don't need to at all. Most of those pieces can be written in 500 to 1500 words and you're done with it, right? So that's that's the sweet spot. Make it short, but give people the link so they can make it long if they want to. Yeah, yeah. Question everything. I hear a little bit of your Swarthmore uh, education coming out there. Is that? 
Oh, I, 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 you know, to, I, I believe, of course, we, we believe all sorts of false things about ourselves. I grew up in Texas and I went to Swarthmore College. And I mean, I would be considered a right winger by today's standards, you know, by today, by Swarthmore standards. Right. But I don't think that's the point. The point is like the process of thinking and learning, not like necessarily the conclusions that you get to on one topic or another. And I will always consider myself a, a Swarthmoreian. And like, I think of myself as having been formed as a thinker or as a writer there that's like that's i studied with people professors who are now probably well to my left but um i i they they taught me how to learn how to think and how to think critically including critically about yourself and um I, to this day, that's like very fundamental to me. And I, every year I've had like interns from Swarthmore, absolutely love the place. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Oh, I'm so glad you brought it up. I was going to ask you about that, but so, so what, what kind of stuff were you reading in college? What, what was the program like? Oh, I, first I was a philosophy major, but I read, I read more Karl Marx than (laughs) I must've read Karl Marx in like five or six different classes, seminars. I read all this, you know, critical social theory and I love it. I mean, people, anybody who thinks I'm a right winger would like think that's, think it's hilarious, but like, uh, I absolutely loved reading Marx. I love, you know, the, the Frankfurt school and like, uh, you know, I, I mean, I I can't even read. I, there were all these sort of critical social theory classes that I took and I took one of like philosophy of science, uh, history and philosophy of science. And it's all this critical thinking stuff. And it's all written by professors who like nowadays would be like the objects of scorn and hate at a turning point (laughs) conference, you know, like they're indoctrinating our youth, like, not really, you know, like the, the professor is a leftist, the professor is a Marxist, but what they're really teaching your kid, if they're doing it right, is like how to question, you know, how to question authority, how to question everything, how to investigate what's really going on underneath things. And ideally, if they do their job right, the student ends up doing what I'd like to believe I did, which is as part of the process, questioning what your professors believe, right? Yeah. And that the, that's the final step is to liberate you from any particular dogma, from any particular belief, right? Everything has to be questioned. Everything has to be scrutinized. Including yourself. Uh, there was one yeah. one column that you wrote, or I, I think you referenced it in that in the last one, but it was from November of 2000. You were, you were sort of eating crow about your prediction that Bush was toast. <laughs> uh, but, but you said something in there uh, that one of the main objectives as a writer Ah, uh, the main one, as you described it, is to get outside the box of conventional punditry and explain how broad hidden biases, not just obvious ideological biases, skew the way we think about current events. So, you know, part of my question is, how do you recognize that in yourself? And also, are you you described it very well in that column in two thousand? But what are some also what are some of the broad hidden biases that are prevalent today versus the the obvious ideological ones? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, the, the first thing that occurs to me off the top of my head is what we call white privilege, right? And white privilege, it annoys so many people on the right. They are, oh, you're calling me a racist. You're saying <laughs> that I hate, you know, black and brown people. I don't, you know, but like, it's not that, right? Like, and some people, on um, there are some sort of lefties who use white privilege as a cudgel, like yeah. you and your white privilege, right? And ideally, Prop, I think white privilege understood in the best way is like things you assume you don't even think about. Right. And you don't have to think about them because you're white. You know, you're like, you know, you you don't worry about you don't worry about being pulled over by police for no reason. Right. It just doesn't happen to me. Uh, it doesn't happen to anybody, does it? Well, actually, it turns out it does. It happens to like Tim Scott, a black guy who's now the senator from South Carolina. Like, you know, Lindsey Graham, the white senator, was th- talking about this. Like, it doesn't happen to me, but Tim Scott it ge- keeps getting pulled over. Why does Tim Scott get pulled over? Like, it just doesn't occur to you that this is going on. It's not happening to you. You're not thinking about it. Or like the way that, you know, in recently the election in Virginia, there was this th- whole thing about the backlash, parents' rights, you know, and parents wanted critical race theory out of their schools. And this word, Nicole Hannah-Jones from the New York Times talks about this, like, not parents, no, not all parents, white parents, right? You like, you, you're white and you just think parents means parents who look like you. And that's just like, 
it's it's not even occurring to you. So that's just a simple a simple version of like you're inside a bubble and you don't realize it. And somebody and now you you, you can then have an argument about what to think once you get out of it. You might get out and say, I still don't like the critical race theory stuff, but at least now I'm aware of what's going on outside of my my perspective, outside of my bubble. Does that make any sense? It does. It does. I, I think that 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 it makes a lot of sense actually because we don't realize that how ill-informed we are based on what we're reading, what we're not reading, or on our you know preferred social media platforms, if, if we're on any of them, what we're unfollowing, you know, not just who we're following, but what we're unfollowing. So there's there's any number of ways that we don't even realize that we get locked in these bubbles, as as you call them, that uh, we become- Yeah, if, if, if you're on Twitter and you're just reading your Twitter feed, that algorithm is learning from your preferences all the time. It's learning your biases and it's feeding them back to you, right? You have to work against that or just by being online. I mean, everywhere you go online, they're tracking you. It's not like they, they, they want to give you what they think you want. Yeah. You know, you, you say you, you keep eating chocolate. I'll keep giving you chocolate. If you don't want, if you want to stop eating chocolate and get like a healthier diet, you have to intervene in that process. Yeah. I remember the first time that uh, that it occurred to me that there was a company that was trying to figure out like my psychographics, uh, not, not just demographics, but psych- it was Netflix early on when we were still getting discs in the mail. And I thought, man, they got me completely wrong. You know, they thought I, I, I don't know, I'm going to get myself into trouble saying this, but I was convinced <laughs> that they thought that I was African-American female lesbian based on all this stuff. I'm like, but it, not that there's anything wrong with that, but like, in a way I was kind of honored. Like I, okay, great. You know, it exposed me to a whole bunch of uh, stuff that I might not have picked on my own. So thank you very much. But they got my, they got my demos wrong. So uh, there's so much of your work that I wanted to dive into uh, a couple in particular. So column in uh, fall of two, 2002, uh, you were writing about whether certain factions trusted the UN or the Bush administration more when it came to actions taken to deter threats from Iraq. And there's a lot we could delve into there. But something you said toward the, the top caught my attention. You said Democrats don't want to show disrespect to the president of the opposite of the opposite party. You didn't say that, but uh, and Republicans don't want to show disrespect to our allies. And again, just like having the lens of 20 years ago uh, and reflecting on where we're at now. Do you think that there's any return to the kind of deference on certain things we once saw across political party lines or more broadly across ideological lines? It's hard to answer that because I'm not sure. Respect is such a complicated thing. It encompasses many other things. I'm not a fan of deference, so I wouldn't want I wouldn't want too much deference to the president or too much deference to some international organization. I, I do still like the spirit of questioning everything um, and of questioning authority. But you, if, if you're not going to have that presumption of authority, what you need is a culture of, of openness to evidence, openness to other points of view. Something You've got to be capable of being moved in the right direction. You've got to like have your eyes, your heart open in some way. And that's a, so that's the thing that I think we need to get back. And I think we can get it back. Some of it is a process of earning trust. Like just a simple thing, like when, you know, politics is so polarized, nobody can admit they're wrong. Nobody, nobody will admit they're wrong. You know, just a little gesture of goodwill. So I'm like, today I'm watching a press conference, the Republic Senate Republicans are doing a press conference and they're doing this scummy thing about like claiming that like crime is up because Democrats are defunding police, which is just false. I mean, defunding police is a stupid slogan that some people on the left came up with and it's almost entirely ignored, you know, but like we're going to blame it's on defund police. And it gets me so pissed off. And I look at this and I think you guys, you're just scummy. You're, you're, you're acting in bad faith. And I hear this then from my friends on the left, you know, like those Republicans, they're just bad faith. You can't listen to anything they're saying. And that cycle is a killer, right? Because now they're acting in bad faith. So now we're not going to acknowledge anything they say, because they're just going to use that. Everything's war, right? 
And somehow we got to break that cycle. And the way to break it is really to put yourself out and just say, you know what? Okay, you're being, you're acting in bad faith, but you're also saying something that's true, right? What's true? In this case, the truth is like, we need to change United States energy policy, right? We've got like, there's like, the Russians are like, you know, they have all this power because they're a gas station, right? They And we, we're not pumping gas and we're trying to move to like, you know, a greener economy and away from fossil fuels, but like we've shut down drilling and like this gives the bad guys who sell oil like more power in the world. The Republicans are right about that. That's just true, right? Is there a way we can acknowledge it? Could we, for example, say, how about if we sit down and work out a deal and you give something and we give something and the deal might be, we will uh, I'll open some of the strategic petroleum reserve. We will allow in the short term, more drilling in the United States so that we can like deprive the bad guys of the ability to sell all their oil and to hold, to control the market. And in exchange for that, you are going to, you Republicans are going to agree that if the bad guys depend economically on selling fossil fuels, how about if we move our economy and the whole world's economy away from fossil fuels? And that's going to mean billions and billions of investment in these tech, you know, technologies for other fuels. We're going to move. We're going to accept nuclear. You were right about nuclear. We should have allowed. We shouldn't have shut down all the nuclear power plants. We, nuclear is safer than what what we're learning about what fossil fuels do. We'll do some of that. We'll, we'll invest in, in uh, technologies for solar, for wind, for, and we're just gonna, we're gonna move the whole country, we'll move the world away from fossil fuels. And then this country that runs as a gas station won't be able to rely on that anymore, right? So that's just an example of how you could have a good faith conversation, right? And then we all sort of move in a positive direction, but we're just kind of stuck in this place where we don't want to acknowledge the other side's truth. Yeah. You know, I, I heard this really interesting theory. I forget. I wish I remembered off the top of my head where I heard it. The, it, it I think somebody might've been talking about it in relation to the uh, MLB, their negotiations with the players union and, and what's happening now. And there was this experiment done like Ivy league school experiment uh, with business students it might've been a Harvard experiment where they said, okay, we have two parties uh, and, and it's uh, take a slice, a, a, a pizza. And right now one party has three slices. The other party has two. Now, if you can agree, you, you're going to, that, that's half the pizza. There's a whole other half of the pizza that we got to decide how to split it up. If you can agree how to split the other half up, then we'll give you all of those other pieces. If you can't agree, then all you get is your three and your two. So a lot of folks said, well, you know, this person has three. So, she, uh, you know, she should get three on the, the other half and he should only get two. Oh, well, it's unfair. So the guy who has two should get three. And there were all these things. But the theory was really that, no, there, there, there is nothing if you can't agree. So if you can agree, it's all upside for everybody. So why not just split the, the extra half? into, you know, three and three or two and a half and two and a half. And, you know, you get to keep your original three, you get to keep your original two, but now every, you can agree on something. So everybody gets that much more, but <laughs> we seem to get caught in like, you know, some like zero sum game on everything or, or just kind of what, you know, what we were saying before from a, a tactical or, or dispositional standpoint that, well, I can't, I can't be seen as giving in to the quote unquote other side. You know, it's not a loyal opposition thing. Um, so I, I don't know how to break that cycle, though. Although we have had like um, we have, uh, you know, the uh, the bipartisan bipartisan infrastructure bill. So we got something done. Right. So is, is there is there any hope for I don't know to to, to heal the rest of the world's problems? <laughs> yeah, no, it's not like this isn't all gone. Right. I mean, just to take two obvious examples, there are two people in Washington right now who believe in compromise and who cut deals and who like, they, they do what you say about the pizza, right? And those guys are Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell. Mm. They're like old time senators who, you know, I mean, and I know people on the left who hate Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell's evil, but yada, yada. Mitch McConnell, like when it came to your, the, your situation, this pizza situation was the, you know, the debt ceiling, right? And Mitch McConnell was not gonna take down the United States and its credit rating over the debt ceiling. 
the danger is some of like the younger people who come into the Senate, you know, who come in with the mentality of the House of Representatives and this total warfare and stuff, or like the Ted Cruz's that that's super dangerous. So like the old guys are holding it together right now. What we really need is a whole new generation of younger people who are sick of the grifters and the polarizers and who are just going to reject the Ted Cruz's and say, you know, we, we got, we got bigger stakes. We have bigger stakes in this world than, than winning a political fight. Yeah. Yeah. You you know, I, I also wanted to ask you about what you think is continuing to fuel some of our collective cognitive dissonance. Not all of us necessarily. I guess all of us suffer from a bit of it here and there, but there are pockets of people who suffer from way too much. Uh, and it's causing the stuff that we've, we've already talked about a bit. But what, what do you think is fueling it? I kind of know the answer. You wrote a column about it last week. But what is your diagnosis and, and what are the cures? Sorry, frame, frame it again, what the, the problem is, diagnosis okay. of. So f- fueling this general cognitive dissonance to keep a certain number of people, uh, to give away part of the answer, like folks who tune into Tucker Carlson every night are under the impression now, based on what he's been saying for several weeks, that, you know, Putin isn't really that bad. It's really the Democrats that are, or social, or liberals or progressives, you know, they're trying to... Um, they're trying to uh, stop us from from practicing Christianity. They're you know they're 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 trying to tell you that you're you're prejudiced. They're trying they 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 these are the same people who is is something that he often says. Um, so I, I guess part of my question is 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 that just an act that he's playing and he's convincing a lot of people, or is that the real Tucker Carlson now? Has he turned into his own Frankenstein monster? And 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 if so, what are what do you think? Do we have any hope? Is there any cure for, for, for what's fueling a lot of folks, as I, as I said, cognitive, general cognitive dissonance? Uh, well, I, I guess I'd go back to what we were discussing at the beginning. You need a combination of, um, this is partly a recognition of my, my limits as a writer, right? I, I can't, I can make an argument and I can present information that I believe to be true. And that I believe that if people would listen to it, it would change their mind. It would open their eyes to something. But a lot of these people are not gonna listen to me. I'm not in their circle and I'm labeled a liberal or whatever. And so I'm on, I'm one of the bad guys or something. They need somebody closer to them. And that's part of why, and some of the people who I've met at Faith Angle, I think are, they have credibility among those folks. I mean, there's a shocking percentage of white evangelicals who believe this complete nonsense that has nothing to do with anything that should be recognized as Christian. They've just fallen into a right-wing cult and they've like, they, they will not listen to me. They will listen to someone close to them. And so all I can hope to do is to present information that might change minds that someone else then who is close to them might present to them. Um, and to the extent I can, I guess I, I would, I would try to convey to those people that I do care about them, that I'm not the enemy and that maybe they hopefully would listen to me, but honestly, Corey, I don't believe that they're going to listen to me, Uh, but that, but that's a, maybe they would listen to you. Maybe they would listen to some of your audience, people in their family. That's, that's the, the neighbors, friends, people in their, in their congregation, um, I, some of the folks, I, the last Faith Angle conference I went to, there were um, a couple of speakers there who, who work in congregations where there are a lot of people who are lost and they, they're lost. They're like, they're trapped in this sort of echo chamber. They've fallen into, you know, what you could only describe as a cult political. They're watching, you know, One America or Newsmax or something. And they believe if you go in it, my gosh, if you watch I recommend to every liberal go and watch One America. Like just watch an hour or two of One America. It's this world where you're, that's it's it's like fentanyl. I mean, you're no, it's not fentanyl, but it's like it's you, it's not designed to teach you anything. It's designed to reinforce. It's designed to hold you in the cult and to like give you reasons to continue to believe the people you believe in the things you believe. It's really hard to pull somebody out of that, except to have someone close to you who who you believe loves you. Well, let me just encourage you a little bit. So I, I am in some of those conversations. Uh, I I became a Christian, like I said, in my late twenties. 
uh, for the first 10 plus years, we were going to a, a very conservative, the theologically conservative church and even more politically and socially conservative uh, population who went to that church. So I'm still in a lot of those conversations and I read your stuff. You just literally just yesterday, I referenced the, uh, the book. I, I referenced um, Bearing Right to someone who is under the wrong impression about certain facts. So just to encourage you, like whether it's your, your columns or you know, podcasts or your book, it still, it, it leaks out, <laughs> you know, it has, it has more, it has an effect beyond just the person who's reading it, you know, not just you, not to blow smoke up your ass, but like it, it there's a lot of good folks who are doing great work, you know, and, and there's folks who are independent voices in, in environments where you wouldn't necessarily think that a person with that perspective can can exist, whether it's, uh, you know, reporters who are doing great work, whether it's for the Post or the Times that we often identify as kind of left leaning um, or or it's folks that are at, you know, Breitbart uh, that maybe don't abide by by that orthodoxy. Again, it's just good, independent thinking folks who really take their, their job as writers and thinkers seriously, it has an effect beyond just the, the eyes, the two eyes that are reading it. Uh, so yeah, I just, you know, don't, don't lose hope, man. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, we, uh, I have so many more questions. We haven't even gotten to Ukraine. So, okay. I do need to, I do want to get into this a little bit. Um, so just so you know, this, this episode will be airing uh, in about a week. Um, so facts on the ground can change drastically between now and then. But from a bigger picture perspective, can you tell us the significance of what's been happening there since Putin invaded Ukraine? Oh my gosh, the significance of it. Uh, well, what I, th- I mean, the first thing that occurs to me is the big, biggest picture, which is that there are a lot of young people. I mean, this is a place where I I'm very happy at this moment to be at the bulwark because I'm working with people who have a significant, a very heavy interest in foreign policy, very big interest in the world and in human rights, which is not to say that liberals don't, but progressives tend to worry more about domestic concerns. That's just a, it just works out that way, right? Um, Except when the United States is the aggressor. Here it's the Russians who are the aggressor, it's Putin. Um, There are a lot of young people Um, who grew up after the world wars, after Vietnam, their only experience of war is sort of the United States, you know, launching a war, the United States going to war in Afghanistan, the United States going to war in Iraq. Um, Maybe they have some vague memory of, you know, Serbia. Um, They, they think that they grew up, they thought that they were living in a a period after the world wars. The world wars were this era and then that was over. And now we're in this era of relative peace and we don't need to worry. And it's sort of typified by Barack Obama telling Mitt Romney in 2012, you know, the 1980s called and they want (laughs) policy back, right? But when Mitt Romney said, you know, Russia was a threat, like Mitt Romney, it turns out two years after Mitt Romney says that Putin goes into Crimea and now Putin goes uh, and takes, tries to take more of Ukraine. Um, if you are a young person who has grown up in this time, you were not living in the period after the world wars. You were living in the period between the wars. And we are not in a world war now. And that the reason is that we're, we know what it's like to be in a world war. And the United States and NATO are taking very careful measures to avoid this turning into another world war. But there are a lot of countries that are now involved in this and it could get really bad. It's already very bad in Ukraine. And what you have to understand is that the world is full of predators. And if you are, particularly if you are a young progressive person um, and your entire focus has been what evils is the United States doing around the world? You know, what wars are we starting and what should we, should we, what sort of, you know, and you think that you represent peace. Peace does not happen because you're nice. I mean, being nice is helpful. Loving people, caring about people, giving people things is all great. And right now people in Ukraine need a lot of help, but there are predators in this world. And if you do not stand up to them, if you leave a vacuum and if you are just the nice people, they will run over you and they will, if they don't hurt you, they will hurt the people close to them. And you have to decide morally how much of that you are going to tolerate. And I think a lot of young people are seeing what's going on in Ukraine right now. 
And what they are experiencing is predation. And what they are realizing about themselves is they will not tolerate that. They are determined to do something to stop it. Uh, we doesn't look like we're going to send troops to do that. And that would be very dangerous. We don't want another world war. But um, we are not just going to turn away. And I think this is morally a very important experience for young people. And they must remember that after this is over, that is not the end of predation. Predation will always be with us unless we prevent it. I appreciate that. And um, you mentioned something. I, I do risk the possibility of sounding myopic right now. But I, I do want to contextualize what's happening in Ukraine and around the world domestically here. You, you, you made a comparison on the podcast with Charlie. You compared how Zelensky's leadership inspired others to also have courage uh, versus the way Republicans here at home, folks like Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney, uh, or, or, or even in the aftermath of January 6th, uh, Mitt Romney, Ben Sass in the Senate. Why do you think that has an inspired courage in other Republicans the way we see it? Zelensky's leadership inspiring courage there and around the world. So Charlie and I were talking about this on Monday, and it was literally in the conversation that I sort of came to what I think is a, a, the default explanation, the default answer to your question. And again, it could be wrong. It's just the, the one that seems, I like simple explanations, right? Very, it, people are usually not like being bought out. Usually they believe something that you can believe is wrong. But the simplest explanation in this case is that things, I mean, to, to contrast the two situations, the simplest explanation, why did, why did Zelensky's courage and the courage of the Ukrainians mobilize the world, but the courage of Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and others who voted for impeachment didn't move the Republican Party? I think the answer is just that what happened in the Republican Party, what is happening in the Republican Party, as awful as it is, is nowhere near as bad as what's happening in Ukraine. I mean, let's just be honest about it, right? There was an attack on the United States government in January 6, 2021. Before that, there was there were attempts to undermine the United States government and the peaceful transfer of power, a threat to democracy in the United States, a threat to the rule of law, extremely serious. It is like the, a, a founding reason for the bulwark. It is, it is an enormously important cause uh, for, the, for the world and for this country. But it is not the same as watching people get shelled and killed by a literal military invasion, right? I think there's something about that that just broke through. So it's some of it's like the courage of the Ukrainians fighting back, but some of it is just the moral awfulness of what's, of what's going on there, which this may sound sort of pessimistic, but it's actually optimistic. It means that there is a bottom, there is a limit of tolerance and the Republican party simply hasn't met that yet. I mean, Donald Trump, one of the worst human beings this country has ever produced, but that's just, a, I mean, I can, I can, I'm never going to argue the Trumpers out of that, but that's just a fact. Still, is nowhere near Vladimir Putin. Nowhere near. He just doesn't have the will to kill that Vladimir Putin does. And if he were to do the things that Putin has done, I would still like to believe that would cross a threshold and that the Republican Party would say, we're not going with that. That's, that's a bridge too far. Yeah, that, that's it's interesting because I thought January 6th, could have been that bottom, but apparently it wasn't. It wasn't drastic enough. Uh, to your point about Donald Trump, thank goodness he was not nearly as competent as as Putin. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, but that that's that that's a whole other podcast. I, I've talked about this before. Oh gosh, so many more questions I could ask you, but uh, I do want to give you the opportunity. Um, do you have any questions for me? Uh, I. Not, nothing so urgent that like I'm I feel like you've you probably got a I mean Corey you, you you put together some questions you put a lot of thought into this I'd like I they're interesting questions I'd, I'd be happy to let you go with it oh no 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 just um I mean a, a lot of a lot of what, what I would ask you we could dig more into so many other things but a lot of what I would ask you is just about your 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 process you know how how has your process changed and evolved over the years, or how has it changed here recently in the last month or so in your, your shift over from Slate to the Bulwark? Uh, the process, uh, by the way, as you were talking, I, I thought, what is the question I'd most like to ask Corey? And the question I wanna ask you is about 
becoming a Christian, but we'll, we'll, we'll set that aside a little bit. Because as a Jew who didn't become a Christian, I'm I'm endlessly curious about this. Yeah. And, and about like you're preserving your Jewish identity and, and how that works. So, but you asked about the process. My, my process is, I mean, I haven't changed my, I am thinking a lot about how to use this opportunity. Like I have a new venue, I have a new platform, it's in a different place. And how can, it, what, what opportunities can I exploit here? And what I've been thinking since I came to the Bulwark is there is a lot of open space, a lot of open space where in, in the part of the political spectrum where the Bulwark is. And first of all, it's in the middle. So that's a huge opportunity. I'm not captive to, you know, the wings. And also the people at the Bulwark are people of tremendous integrity who are thinking through things all the time. And I would include in this people at the Dispatch, which is a more sort of conservative oriented publication, but also the people I know there. Uh, basically all these people in the Republican party are former Republicans or conservatives who rejected Trumpism. They've, they're trying to figure out what to think. They have principles, but they're trying to figure out how to apply them in this world where the Republican party has gone crazy. And so there's this amazing opportunity to sort of discuss what's true and what we, you know, what, what our, where our values should lead us, how to apply our values in this time. And it's, it's not like you're not stuck in an orthodoxy. You're not stuck in the, a left or right wing bubble. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking, how to, how to work in this space. And part of what I want to do, I think, is like we've become the people in the middle who rejected Trump are still sort of traumatized by Trump. And Trump is still a very serious danger because he's like the most likely person to be nominated for president. He could actually become president again. And if you he, he's already said he would do things like take the United States out of NATO, which is like, I mean, he's, he's a huge danger to the world, this guy, right? We, we can't forget that. But we also have to like broaden out from him and talk about positively, you know, what we think, what we care about. So part of what's going on in Ukraine right now, I'm thinking about how can we talk about this crisis in a way that can help young people? Because I'm getting older and I'm thinking about, you know, how to like help people think about this new world and open their minds to new ideas, to, to facts and to like orienting, them, orienting themselves toward the challenges and problems of the world. So yeah, it's that open space thing that I'm, that I'm, that's, that's what's different for me. Does that make any sense? No, it totally does. And actually you, and the, the, another question I was going to ask you is more of a favor is what reasons do we have to be hopeful? But you sort of, you sort of answered that. Uh, the other question, kind of going back to your roots, uh, I will answer your question if, if you want me to um, about, about that, that transition or conversion or evolution, but were you, was your family observant? My my family was it's it's a my family was not particularly observant. So you're Jewish. <laughs> I was so yeah. I'm I'm and and I'm like a terrible Jew. I'm like yeah. I mean, here's how I describe my being Jewish. I was uh, I, I grew up in a family of five kids. I was kid number four. In in between kids number three and four, we moved to Texas from New York and. In you were between, the Jewish family in Texas. I, yeah, we were. We were <laughs> literally Corey and at Swarthmore. I we literally did a sketch called "The Only Jew in Texas," and it was about a cowboy. And we all did all these, you know, it was like Dirty Harry, except it was called Dirty Jaime. We did all these sort of things. <laughs> so in in jokes, you know. That's no, I don't. Mean, I don't mean to offend people. This is like black people using the N word. You know, like Jews can say that with the H word. Anyway. Um, the, the but but part of what happened between kids three and four is also when I was in sixth grade, my mother decided to become Jewish. She my my parents have, are, are both dead now, um, but they um, my, and they they would my mother would never have you know admit this, but like we were not practiced. Uh, there was a point, Corey, when I assure you, we had a fireplace and there were stockings hung on that fireplace <laughs> on that mantle, right? And like that, I then like it, you know, that's how un-Jewish we became. And then my when I was in sixth grade, my mom decided like we were going to like get serious somehow. I don't know. Three kids have gone through and now like I'm getting sent to religious school at a yeah. reform congregation in Houston. And like I'm getting bar mitzvah and my little brother's getting bar mitzvah. So there's this whole Jewish period. And like it, but 
and and I I love Judaism, but like I today don't like I belong to a congregation, but it's my wife is the reason we belong, and my kids got you know bar and bat mitzvah. But like in terms of what I believe, I'm kind of agnostic. I believe in up. Okay. I believe in up and I believe in, I believe in a non intervening God. I got to put it that way. Right. You know, like I don't believe in a God that can be falsified by the shelling of Kharkiv <laughs> that way. <laughs> right. Right. But that's, that's where I am. So tell me where you are. So uh, just say, so are you, you're in the DC area, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Bethesda. One of my best friends um, is, is not too far from you. And he, he, it sounds like he has a similar philosophy, uh, theology if you could call it that and they they belong to a i want to say humanistic congregation so it, it's um their 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 kids are are learning about their jewish heritage and appreciating that but from a philosophical standpoint they um judaism is practiced uh, more human humanistically humanistic uh, not necessarily atheism but sort of a non-theistic approach to it so if, i'll tell you offline if, if you're curious about that congregation I think Dana Milbank goes to the same congregation. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I grew up in a very observant Jewish home. We went to an Orthodox synagogue. So, you know, we kept kosher, Shabbos, all the holidays. We weren't just like the once a year Jews. But I would say like many, my parents raised me to be an independent thinker, uh, to think critically. And as my dad says, damn it, one of the biggest mistakes I made because I began doing that the older I got. And I wouldn't say I necessarily got cynical about Judaism so much as some of the questions that were beginning to form in my late uh, teen years and into my 20s, I didn't find satisfactory set of answers in Judaism. So I continued to search. And um, that combined with um, relationships with, with people I really, res really respected, one of whom grew up Jewish and became a Christian and uh, I started reading some stuff and it, it, there was this one season where I was just reading voraciously. It was literally, my wife thought there was something wrong with me. I was reading probably 10 hours a day at the time. So this was in through the spring and summer of 2000. And the whole time I still hadn't read the New Testament. I thought that, you know, I do believe in an open universe. I do believe in a, a God that can act inside of his creation, although he does it rarely. So I thought if I cracked open the New Testament, I get struck down by light by, the, you know, the God of Israel. And, you know, but I finally read it and I started I'm like when I read it with, with my upbringing, because I went to Hebrew school. I went to JCC when I was a little boy in Hebrew school and Hebrew high school. I, I, I was reading a very Jewish document. Um, you know, Jesus's interactions with the Pharisees looked like the rabbis interactions with each other that are written down in, in the Talmud. It just, so it, it struck me. And then uh, some of the other uh, theology that I was reading, uh, some of the more popular stuff like C.S. Lewis, um, some of the less accessible stuff uh, like uh, Yoder's work that he was doing at, at uh, Notre Dame. It just made sense to me. And, and then finally uh, in the fall of 2000, I, I gave my life to the Lord, but I saw it. I, I didn't see it as a conversion necessarily. I just saw it as more, it was more akin to what the disciples, the, the way that the disciples of Jesus saw it as like, Oh, this is the next chapter. Like God is telling this story in his creation or her creation or however you want to look at it, God's creation. And this is the next chapter. He's, you know, the, the, the bigger story, and even if you approach it from more of a literary standpoint, it just made sense to me that there's this creator God, you know, it, it, it was created beautifully and perfectly, but because of certain things like free will and, and his, his crown creation, being able to choose whether they were in communion with him and love him, that they, um, they chose wrong because they weren't God, they were creatures, they, they weren't the creator, they were creatures. Um, and, and, but then the rest of the project was redeeming that creation. You know, so as as I, it, it gave me perspective. It gave me sort of this uh, macrocosmic and microcosmic sort of perspective of about what we were participating in. Jews think of it as tikkun olam. You know, so it's sort of an extension of that tikkun olam. So I don't know. I don't know if this is making any sense, but that's those are some of the things that were rattling around in my brain. I love that. I love it in part. First of all, it it's it makes a lot of sense in terms of this the, the, your your journey. And also it's challenging. So one of my notions, which is I tend to think of the Old Testament and New Testament as very different, except the, the twist is 
I'm a Jew, so I'm supposed to favor the Old Testament, but I really like the New Testament. I mean, the, <laughs> I, 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 I like the New Testament sensibility. For I just love I, I. It's kind of a prejudice, but I just I like religion that's centered around love. Yeah. And the Old Testament is mostly centered around beating your children. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's I'm not. It's not. A, I mean, it's like a, this angry God who's like constantly striking people down, or there's everything's you know things are driven by fear. I my son had the sacrifice the sacrifice of Isaac as his bar mitzvah portion, and I'm just like really. I mean, and the, the the Torah teacher like gave him a whole rationalization of the sacrifice of Isaac, and I'm sitting there the whole time thinking. This is garbage. I really hate this story. And I, you know, we, we, we don't have to get into the whole thing. But anyway, like, um, you know, notions of hell don't appeal to me at all. I mean, hell's not supposed to be a notion that appeals to you. But but there's so much of, you know, the New Testament is so much more about love. And uh, and I'm immensely attracted to like New Testament to, to sort of love oriented the idea of agape, you know. So uh, you know, I love the New Testament. I at the same time. I have this weird disjunction between what I believe and what I like, right? So, uh, and that's probably helpful to me in a lot of ways, but it keeps me from becoming a Christian. Like I, I don't believe things to certain things to be true, but there's a very deep resonance of the New Testament story with the best in human nature. And I see Christians doing incredible, wonderful things all the time. And I see people being motivated by this vision and the, the Jesus as a model for how to live. It's so beautiful and it does such good in the world. So I, I'm just immensely, I, I, I love it and I admire it and I'm, and I'm glad that you found it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're hanging out with guys like Josh Good and, and Michael Gerson and even David Brooks, I, I think you're getting a really beautiful, um, well thought out or, you know, there's there's uh, that line in, in the Shema, uh, which which was also, you know, echoed in, in the New Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. We're supposed to you know, we're supposed that 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 indicates so many different aspects of who we are as, as human beings. And I, I, there are some folks who identify as Christians who are doing that well. You know, there's obviously a lot of folks now, you know, Christian nationalists and what have you. I'm sure your family has similar roots to mine, you know. My, my own grandmother, who was very important in my life, uh, she, she, oh, this is really relevant. She, uh, her family had to escape Cherny Ostrov, which is in the middle of, of what's now, you know, Ukraine. At that time, I think it was still Russia when they fled, but it was, it's Ukraine. Um, but, you know, it was, it was, you know, any number of groups, whether it was the Cossacks or the Tsarists or the, the Bolsheviks, all, you know, all of the various groups were wearing crosses on their shields and their helmets. Uh, and, and those were the guys, the guys that identified as Christians that were burning down our houses, raping our, our women, uh, be, beheading our neighbors. Literally, like these are the stories that my grandmother uh, survived as a little girl before they left. In fact, um, tomorrow today, is today March 1st? Today. So we're today, recording today. this on March 1st. So today March 3rd, 1921. Uh, so almost uh, j just less than 101 years ago is when my family landed on uh, Ellis Island. Wow. Um, so, I, but we could get into the, I had some re responses to the, uh, the binding of Isaac, um, <laughs> but uh, I, that's a whole different route. What I will say is that a lot of folks look at that as a, the, you know, sacrificing our children, which if you have kids, the thoughts occurred to you, <laughs> you <know? laughs> but in, in all seriousness, that story, if again, looking at it from a literary standpoint for the people who were first hearing those stories and then reading those stories when it was written down, it was it was first being told in, in a culture that was surrounded by other cultures where that was the norm. So the fact that the main character of this story said it had reason and was justified in stopping that. That was the significance of the story. Not that he was going to sacrifice his kid, but had he the sacrificing of children stopped. That's I don't know. Maybe that sounds like a I, I, yeah. to you. I, it's, I've, yeah, that was one of the arguments that was presented. You know, Rabbi so and so says this, but you know, the idea that the whether you're going to here is this very fundamental material thing, killing your child. And I hear your, I hear the point about the context of the day, but the fact that this changes that the person is willing to do this because 
God told him, and he waits until God says not to do it. I just think that is so extremely dangerous. Um, as and, and so I, I want a better foundation for people behaving morally and not doing terrible things than waiting for a divine voice. Yeah. And maybe if I believe the divine voice always came, I would have more. I, I, I don't trust that mechanism for avoiding atrocities. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's a good point. I, I am. I have to say I, I'm more than cynical. I'm suspicious of folks who say, you know, God told me to go to Kmart aisle 12 and block, you know, like, I, I don't know, you know, there are ways to check that. Like, you know, for, first of all, if you're an Orthodox Christian or, or you, you, you know, Bible thump Christian like me, check your Bible. If it doesn't match up with what the, the, you know, the virtues that are espoused in the Bible scripture, you, you can be pretty sure that God's not telling you that, <laughs> you know, like, uh, you know, Donald Trump is supposed to be the most virtuous person on the face of the earth. No, he's actually not. He, he's the actual opposite of the fruit of the, I could open up any page of the Bible. I have this running bet with some of my friends and it testifies against the words, character and, and actions of Donald Trump. But that's a whole other podcast. Well, I will just say one thing about that. Once you start talking about virtue and virtues as illustrated in parts of scripture and how they all fit together, now you're in my world or I'm in your world of philosophy. Now we're talking about it's based in scripture, but there's there are ideas that cohere and they're illustrated in stories and they're illustrated in life. And when you have an understanding, a, a theory of virtue a belief, a, that, that says you can do these things and you can't do these other things. And one of the things you can't do is murder your children. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now I'm starting to feel a lot more comfortable. What I right. don't like is that, is that listening to God and doing this reflexive response to the voice, right? There's so many people who have literally murdered people in this world because they heard voices so uh, I like this version of religion, your version, in which we we learn from scripture and we build a theory of virtue based on based on the scripture, and that guides our lives. Yeah, again, going back to a central, you know, Judeo Christian and Muslim, frankly, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So if something isn't making sense to you, you, you got to check yourself. You know, if something doesn't feel, it has to feel right. It has to reckon with, you know, our, uh, I think the word is numinous, our, our something transcendent in us. Um, so it has to reckon with our, our intellect. It has to reckon with all aspects of who we are as humans, you know, and, and a lot of this just doesn't reckon with any of it, let alone all of it altogether. So uh, like I said, I could do this all day, but how can we find you, the bulwark and all the great work that you're doing? Uh, so I... I write for the Bulwark now. I have a, I have only only a few articles since I just joined there. Um, but if, if they go to thebulwark.com, and you know, people, it's funny. Like people think it's Bulwark. <laughs> well, hopefully, it's not Bull. It certainly is work. <laughs> but the, the the Bulwark, for those who don't know, is spelled B U L W A R K. So one L and it's an A instead of an O, and it's all one word. The Bull, uh, the Bulwark. Um, and you can also just type it in. Type in the word Bulwark online. And you'll 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 find it. Um, and I have a few articles there. I'm gonna build a lot more. I have an archive at Slate. If you if you just type my name in and Slate, you'll you'll get that. Um, that's as Corey as you're saying. It's like 2,500 or so uh, uh, articles I wrote over those 25 years. So that's that's where and I, and I'm on Twitter and I I I'm doing trying to do more Twitter because I really believe that that is a place where I know people hate Twitter, but a lot of a lot of things can be conveyed quickly, concisely, uh, in short form on Twitter, and I believe it's the responsibility of those of us who want discourse to be more productive and respectful uh, to to be in forums like that and and offering people ways of learning about the world, particularly in the context of something like Ukraine, where there's a lot of information to be passed around and to be analyzed and understood, and where there's a lot of misinformation to be corrected. Yeah, it's good stuff. I, I can't recommend it more highly enough. And uh, the Bulwark as a whole, I, I've been a subscriber since very early. I think it was a little over a year ago that they opened up the subscription model. Um, and it's been well worth it. The Thursday night, Thursday evening hangouts, which I think you were you were on your first one. Was it last week? or the week I, I did. I've done a couple of them now. Um, I loved and and I will tell people. First of all, like it, we, 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 we incur, I mean, the, the subscriptions are like a hundred bucks for the year. And I know that's a lot of money for a lot of people, but like you get access to a whole bunch of these podcasts and they're really interesting. And one of the, one I, when I joined as a subscriber, 
uh, I, you know, you get access to these the video podcasts. And when I was thinking of coming to work at the Bulwark, they, they approached me and I was thought, I wonder what it's like to work with these guys. And I simply sat down and watched because I was a subscriber. I watched like hours of the Thursday night Bulwarks. And you, you're, you're seeing like a different cast every week, four different people. And I met all of my prospective colleagues and I thought, I love these people. I would love to work with these people. And so like that was, and I would like to hope that like your, your listeners, your, your audience would have a similar experience of like, boy, these are really great people. I would like to be part of this family. Yeah. It's kind of like the new friends, you know, <laughs> all the, the cast of characters, how they, they all interact with each other and the different chemistry among the different, the different characters, but it's real and they're real people. And, you know, so uh, um, maybe that was a bad analogy. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Anyway, this has been a blast. I really appreciate your time, Will. It's been great getting to know you a little bit better. And I hope it's not the last time that we hang out. I, I, I just really, I really value all the work that you're doing and, and um, your, your candor, uh, your reflection, your, your integrity as a writer. It's just, it's a real gift to us all. So I really appreciate it. Corey, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I hope we have many more. I hope so too. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review and comments wherever you get your podcasts and tell a friend about TPNR. We're easier to recommend than ever. It's politicsandreligion.us. It's politicsandreligion.us. You can even support our program through the patron app on our site. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. If you dig what we're doing here, it is super easy to follow us. You can go to our site, politicsandreligion.us. That's with the and spelled out, A-N-D. Politicsandreligion.us. And we're on all the socials, at TP and R pod. You know, TP and R pod for talking politics and religion pod. And here's a big way you can support us, by becoming one of our patrons. You can even become a producer or executive producer of our program and have a lot more say in who we bring on, the kinds of questions we explore, or just help us keep the lights on. But mostly, we really appreciate you giving us a listen. So for the whole team here at Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam.